Hey everyone, welcome to Bulletproof Executive Radio. This is a special treat. This is the first time ever that we're shooting video in my biohacking facility, and this is pretty amazing. We've got professional photography, and you'll be able to listen to this in your car, or you'll be able to watch it on YouTube or on the website. So I'm really excited. And our first ever video guest is very photogenic in his purple shirt here. <laughs> it's Chris Ryan, author of Sex at Dawn. Sex at Dawn is an amazing book that came out in about 2010. And this book was about the societal changes around, or societal history of how men and women interact sexually and in relationships. And it, I would say, broke a lot of academic glasses, you could say. It seems like you sort of shattered some myths and maybe caused a little bit of consternation among certain groups. <laughs> That's one way to put it, yeah. <laughs> some consternation, yeah. So, so aside from being the author of Sex at Dawn, yeah. what are the other things in your background? Like, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I come from a family of academics. My, my dad taught in university. My uh, grandfather taught in university. My mother uh, taught in high school. So I grew up around books and uh, studied literature and as an undergraduate at Hobart College in upstate New York. And uh, what happened was I found a loophole in the student handbook that, um, that I figured out I could skip my junior year and still graduate on time, uh, thereby saving my parents a bunch of money yep. and getting me out of town for a while. So I decided, this was 1983, I guess, uh, I decided I wanted to see a frontier. That was my sort of fantasy. Because I was reading earlier, we were talking about Moby Dick. I was reading a lot of these sort of adventure novels, yeah. Joseph Conrad and you know, all these people on the road. And uh, so what I did was I hitchhiked from New York to Alaska and worked in a uh, salmon cannery in Kenai, Alaska for the summer and then uh, hitched back to New York uh, for my senior year. And that, uh, that experience changed everything. I, I, I met all these people on the road, had all these adventures, got in trouble. I was in prison for a couple days. I mean, all this crazy stuff happened. And it changed my life. And, and I decided uh, I wasn't going to go to grad school as I had planned. I, I was all set to go to Oxford and get a PhD in literature and this whole thing. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to see the world. So what happened was... From that point until my mid-30s, I basically backpacked around the world and had adventures and, and did strange jobs all over the place and, you know, lived low to the ground. The image I remember reading a long time ago, uh, an essay by Robert Frost, uh, where he says, uh, like a piece of ice on a hot stove, a poem must ride its own melting. Nice. And I, I thought of my own life that way. I thought, like, I'm just going to ride the melting of my innocence or my youth or whatever it is that's melting. I'm going to ride that, you know. And so that's what I did. And I didn't go back to grad school and get a Ph.D. in psychology till uh, the late, well, this was the mid-90s. So I was, uh, you know, well into my 30s by then. So that's, that's my thing. So I'm sort of like people think I'm a scientist or something, but because I have a PhD in psychology, um, I guess I am technically, but really I'm more of, a, you know, I guess an adventurer or something. And I'm certainly not an academic. I, so you were born like 10 or 15 years too late? Is that... uh, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, because if I had, you know, I was, I was born in 62. So in like, you know, 70, I was eight. And I can remember hanging out with my aunt and uncle who were really cool hippies. You know, they had the Volkswagen van and they had the big German shepherd named Luke and they had the Crosby, Stills, Nash yeah. records and the funky friends. And, I, and I'm eight and I was like, these people are having a really good time, you know, and I'm a kid, you know, but if I were a little older, you mm -hmm. know, I'd be right into this party. So yeah, I, I sort of did grow up with a, a bit of a frustration that I was born a little, a little late and miss out on the whole 60s. Because then by the time I was 15, 16, it was disco and John yeah, Travolta no and shit. Yeah, I mean, that, <laughs> it was a different party, yeah. you know, a party I didn't really want to be at. So that's my story. So you don't see a lot of people with sort of that background becoming PhDs after all that right. life training. 
So did you see a lot of stuff there that led you to write Sex at Dawn? I mean, it, it's a pretty controversial yeah. book where you're basically making the case for non-monogamy. Is that a safe way to put it? Well, it, it's not a book of advocacy at yeah. all, right? It's not saying that non-monogamy is better than monogamy in, in any ultimate sense. But it's saying that uh, the truth is that our ancestors uh, evolved in a social context where sexuality was part of the whole social bonding uh, of hunter-gatherer mm -hmm. groups. And I mean, this, you asked if I saw something on the road that led to that, and, and I did because what happened was I was, you know, I was sort of spending a lot of time in Asia, India, Southeast Asia, and Latin America, and I saw how things that we assume to be human nature are really very much cultural. Yeah. You know, whether we're talking about food or sexuality or, you know, you know, in India, people think cricket is a fantastic sport. It, to me, it's just ridiculous, right? In parts of China, it's actually a meal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, yeah, there's that too. There's cricket and there's crickets, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. In Thailand, they're eating ants and, yeah. and all sorts of insects, and it turns out they're really nutritious. And you I know, eat them, yeah. yeah, it's called mini livestock these days, right? <laughs> In the U.S., there are mini livestock companies, and you know, I could just imagine these tiny little guys on horses, you know, like, herding the ants. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I, I got a, an appreciation for a multicultural uh, perspective uh, on on these questions, and, and I'm very interested in you know, what is human versus what is cultural. Right. And I've always been interested in that. So uh, we were talking earlier, I, I did a lot of um, research and uh, I know a lot of people in that sort of altered states intellectual crowd, yeah. like, you know, Sasha Shulgin and some of the scholars of shamanism. And that's a great opportunity to say, okay, we all experience these altered states. We all dream. We all have mythologies. Mm -hmm. We all... Um, you know, have spiritual tendencies. Uh, so does that mean, how do these things manifest in different cultures, right? So it gives you that opportunity to look at a universal that's shaped by a culture. Uh, and I think sexuality is another one of those yeah. things. Yeah. So the reason I went back to grad school was I, uh, you know, I thought I wanted to get a PhD because I wanted to make a living with my brain. Mm -hmm. I was getting tired of teaching English and, you know, I, yeah. you, it's tough to make a living. And so I thought, you know, I'm pretty smart and I can write. And so if I have a PhD, people take me a little more seriously, yeah. which unfortunately is the case. Um, but I thought that studies in psychology were all watching rats in a maze, behavioralist kind of stuff. And I went to this place called Findhorn in Scotland. You ever heard of that? I haven't heard of Findhorn. It's a, it's a new age center. Uh, it was started in 1962. It's one of the oldest ones. I had read about it in a book called The Secret Life of Plants. Oh, I know that book well. Yeah. It's an amazing biohacker book from the old school. From the yeah. old school, yeah. From 66, 67, yeah. something like that. So if you read the book again, you'll, you'll see that a lot of it, they talk about Findhorn. It's this place in Scotland where they grew these monstrous mm -hmm. cabbages and, yeah. you know, and all this stuff that... It, it was growing in, in the sand next mm -hmm. to the North Sea, and there's like no reason this stuff should be growing. It's where they started talking to plants and playing yeah. music and all that. For people listening, The Secret Life of Plants is basically one of the first neurofeedback researchers, the guy who invented the polygraph, would hook up electrodes like these. By the way, these electrodes just live there. I didn't just put them there for this. <laughs> uh, so, But he took them up to plants and he figured out that he could get a useful electrical signal off plants. Right. Therefore, there's something going on with plants that we didn't know about before that. The book is controversial. Some people say it's hocus pocus. Uh, the guy had data. <laughs> I'm just saying when you have data right. and it matches the hocus pocus, you got to reset your head. So that's what we're talking about if this is, if this is new to you. I remember, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they also talk in that book about they're getting the, the electromagnetic readings from the plants, and then they, even when they think about cutting the leaf of the plant, yeah. it, there's a spike. Yeah. The, so there's some mm -hmm. sort of telepathic 
communication going on with the plants. Yeah, apparently. you can assign a you know consciousness <clears throat> to the spike or not. <laughs> but the fact is that when you think about it, with a lot of double blind, like reasonably good research, that something weird electrical happens in the plant before you cut it, or if you come near it with fire and things like that. So it's some kind of primitive uh, nervous system or electrical yeah. thing. But it's worthy of more study in my biohacker opinion. But it's also other people just really, if that's possible, then all sorts of other things are possible and it makes them uncomfortable. So. Right. Threaten the paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. So, Consternation right. ensues. So anyway, I was at Finhorn and there I met, uh, I met people who had uh, doctorates in psychology who were really interesting, very open-minded people. Right, open that would to these be the, sorts the of place things. to go, right? Right, and so that's that was an epiphany for me. Like, wow, I could get a PhD in psychology. There are places, you know, legitimate schools that that can do this, but I don't need to become a rat counter. You know, mm -hmm. I don't need to sacrifice uh, an open mind in order to do it. So then, I went home and I wrote a letter in the middle of the night to Andrew Weil. Mm -hmm. who we were talking about. I'm, I'm going to go visit him in the next couple of days. He lives nearby. And uh, just out of the blue, and he, his first four or five books are all about consciousness yep. before he got into the alternative and, medical stuff. And Andrew Wiles is, I'd say, world-famous alternative medicine guy. You've probably seen him. He has this giant white beard, and he's written cool books about mushrooms, the hallucinogenic and non-hallucinogenic kind. Yeah. And he's actually one of the first alternative medicine guys about 15 years ago that I started reading. So he's someone who spent his career both on the consciousness and the alternative medicine side. And when you bring those two things together and you attach electrodes and start quantifying it, you kind of get biohacking. So he's yeah. he's an amazing guy. And so yeah. you can go visit him. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, just a, an aside to talk about Andrew Weil for a minute. He went to Harvard, did his um, bachelor's degree in botany. Uh, then he went to Harvard Medical School. I did not know that. And uh, did his residency at U UMass in mm -hmm. Boston. So as, as far as like a medical career, like he's at the top of the top. Then from there he went to the National Institutes of Health in Be Bethesda. Mm -hmm. uh, which is the top research position you could get. So he was like riding this wave. Uh, and this, he was there in the late 60s. He was at Harvard when uh, Timothy Leary was mm -hmm. doing his stuff. Um, but anyway, I, I just think it's really interesting that he started with botany, right? Very few medical students study botany as undergrads. It's, it's almost know. unheard of. I yeah, it's, you know, chemistry, physics, yeah. maybe, whatever. But botany. So he's got a very deep appreciation for plants, and, uh, and a much more holistic understanding of, you know, he's one of the guys, one of the first guys who talked about how uh, wrongheaded it is that we extract what we call the active principle yeah. of aspirin, you know, to make aspirin. From white or, willow bark or Exactly, whatever, right? yeah. Because there are so many other compounds that are in there that we might not understand how they work, <laughs> but they do. Yeah. And they work together. Yeah. Um, and that's why cocaine is so much worse than coca. You know, coca leaf is not bad at all, actually. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty wonderful, actually. yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's Andrew Weil. So I, I wrote this letter to Andrew Weil in the middle of the night, really not thinking he'd even see the letter, because I'm sure he gets hundreds of letters from desperately yeah. ill people. But I just, I said to him in this letter, you know, I admired his work, and I wanted to do something in psychology that was sort of similar to what he had done in medicine. Because he doesn't reject the Western not paradigm yeah. but he says it's it's good for certain things if you're in a car accident you go to the emergency yeah. room right but if you've got a chronic skin condition maybe you want to look into ayurvedic or mm -hmm. maybe there's something in chinese medicine that would be you know less disruptive than taking cortical steroids or whatever yeah. so he he applies the appropriate cultural um perspective based upon what the issue is and i wanted to do that in psychology Mm -hmm. So that's why I wrote to him. Two weeks later, I came home. There's a message on my answering machine. Oh, he called you. He called, and I didn't put a, my number in a, there. What a gentleman. I, he I called that. the Spanish information and got my number. Wow. And he left this message saying, hey, Chris, it's Andy Weil. Got your car, your letter. Thanks so much. You know, I'd love to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. Give me a buzz. <laughs> so we've been friends ever since. Wow. Um, and that's my, uh, that's how I got to know him. And I don't even remember what your question was, but that's my big long answer to it. It was sort of, how did you get here? Oh, uh, yeah. No, I've got to ask, can we get 
Andrew Weil on the Joe Rogan show because you and I have both been on Joe Rogan, <laughs> and I think that would be probably the most fascinating Joe Rogan show ever. We, <laughs> could we've be pretty do interesting. This. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'll talk to him about it. We'll see. Um, I don't think he knows who Joe Rogan is. Well, they're different different segments, but I yeah. Think... But his his daughter is going to be Andy's daughter's up at the house, and yeah. and I met her in Barcelona. She's probably in her mid twenties now. Um, she probably knows who Joe Rogan is. So I'll see, I'll introduce it, mm-hmm. you know, when she's there. Yeah. And if she's like, Dad, you got to do it, then then maybe we can do it. I mean, Joe's walking around with a DMT molecule tattoo on his <laughs> arm, right? So, like, there's got to be a connection between these guys. That would be probably, like, one of the top shows ever. So, yeah. uh, all right. Well, they um, definitely know a lot of the same people. Yeah. You know, like Dennis McKenna mm-hmm. or the people like that. Yeah, you let, know, I'm let's, sure they, let's do that. It, yeah. it, it would be beautiful. So um, we can both ping Joe, you ping, and all right. we'll, we'll make it happen. All right. All that right. sounds good. Yeah. So let's talk some more about your book because I know a lot mm. of people are really interested in in what what you said there about the history of humans right. and sexual relationships and monogamy. So give us like the three minute cliff notes because okay. I'm sure there's some big questions buried in there and uh, just to get everyone caught up who yeah. hasn't read your book. Well, essentially, uh, mainstream science says that since the beginning of, of mm-hmm. humanity, men have been obsessed with the fidelity of women. Of mm-hmm. contr- So the only way you can make sure that this child is yours is to control your mate's sexual behavior, right? right? So this sort of uh, militant male jealousy over women is built right into our DNA because according to the logic, uh, a man doesn't want to invest in a child that isn't his child because in terms of evolutionary theory, that would be a huge mistake, right? You're putting all your resources into a child that contains someone else's DNA, then your life is a big disaster, right? According to that that way of looking at things. Um, so it's been assumed that the, there's like this built-in war between the sexes where women are looking for the best provider and men are looking for a woman with a lot of fertility that they can control throughout her fertile life. So, and then the men also want to screw around and sleep with yeah. other women because mm-hmm. it doesn't cost anything to have an orgasm, whereas the woman's trying to control. So the whole yeah. men, men and women are locked in this battle of the sexes, right? Uh, or as, as I think it was John Grace, you know, men are from Mars, women are from yeah. Venus, right? He's a friend, right? So what... What uh, Casilda and I argue in Sex at Dawn is that this way of looking at sexuality, this this sort of conflict between men and women, is not built into our nature, is not evolved into our DNA. In fact, this is an economic struggle that only came onto the scene about 10,000 years ago with the advent of agriculture. And this way of looking at each other, this way of looking at children, this way of thinking in terms of investment of resources, all this stuff, this is a post-agricultural way of looking at relationships. So, so Sex at Dawn is the paleo sex book? Right. That's, <laughs> that's essentially what it is, yeah. So we're, what we argue in Sex at Dawn is that the, the nature of human sexuality is like our closest primate relatives, the chimps and the bonobos, is a much more promiscuous model which is why long-term sexual monogamy is so difficult for us, for men yeah, and women. 50% of marriages fail sort of thing, right? Right, you know, and, and how many of the other 50% have failed, but they just stay married, you know? I mean, it... If you assume a small percentage, you got more than half, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and it's funny, you know, I, I said it in an interview recently, if 50% of parachutes didn't open, we'd be redesigning parachutes, right? <laughs> But, you know, we've got 50% of marriages that fail. That's a first marriages. Then second marriages, it's a higher proportion and so on. So, but we're still insisting, no, no, this is nature. This is the way it's supposed to be. You know, anyway, the three, I've gone beyond the three minutes. But essentially what we're arguing in Sex at Dawn is we say, okay, let's look at the the four most relevant uh, sources of information on the mating systems of our ancestors. Mm -hmm. So we look at primatology. Right, mm-hmm. the, the primates most closely related to humans, chimps and bonobos. We look at uh, human anatomy. What's the design of our body say about the way our ancestors' sex lives were? Interestingly, it says a lot. 
Um, we look at contemporary psychosexuality, research on what sort of porn turns people on, how men and women respond differently to different things. Uh, and then we look at uh, the anthropological literature. Mm -hmm. So how do hunter-gatherer people or pre-agricultural people in different parts of the world, how do they deal with sexuality? Is there evidence uh, in, in anthropology that uh, our ancestors dealt with sex far differently than we'd assume? Turns out all those sources of information conspire or, or come together in one vision of our ancestor sexuality, which is scandalous for some people, yeah. but, you know, look, look around us, you know. You ever heard of a book called The Erotic Engine? No. It's interesting, the, I don't remember the author's name, but the argument is that every advance in technology and communication <laughs> technology is fueled by a hunger for sex. My career in cloud computing is like that. You know, where do you think Skype video came from? Straight out of porn. There you go. I mean, all of the internet, all the online audio, payments. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. those technologies. I mean, early photography, <laughs> VHS. Yeah. You know, like yeah, all that stuff. The the initial money comes from this it, hunger for even porn. Even the first lunar probe. There was a <laughs> probe. Like <laughs> probe. <Sorry>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just brought the academic level. Yeah. <laughs> oh, crashing, crashing to the floor. Um, all right. So I went way over my three no, minutes that, there, that but was, that's that's the elevator pitch. That was perfect. Yeah. Uh, so. By now, I'm sure there's a few eyebrows raised amongst people listening, saying, what? But you did something that I think is really important that PhD researchers tend to do but don't talk about that much, <clears> which <throat> is the quantification of this. You're saying, well, look at the data. Right. If 50% of people are doing this, and then you look at these other like sort of hints there, and you can either say, I don't like the data, therefore it must be wrong, and I'm going to change it, <laughs> which unfortunately happens in some settings, or you can say, all right, now that this is in my paradigm, this is my awareness, what are the puzzle pieces that fit? And that's right. what I thought was really cool about your book. Is you said, mm -hmm. all right. And yeah, you did. You did piss off a few people, to be perfectly honest. Who'd you piss off the most? <laughs> I hope Steven Pinker. Uh, <laughs> but he hasn't you know, given me the satisfaction of telling me whether he's pissed off or not. But um, yeah, we... We got, we got into it a bit with Steven Pinker, not about sexuality, but about his theories of uh, prehistoric warfare, uh, which is sort of, there's a part, the, the center of the book is a section where we don't really talk about sex much, but we say, well, if we're talking about how sexuality fit into the whole social dynamic mm -hmm. of our ancestors, then we have to talk about other aspects of their social life. So we talk about family structure, um, uh, power relationships, mm -hmm. politics, uh, economics. And the thing is, it turns out that among all hunter-gatherer people, and remember, all of our ancestors lived as hunter-gatherers until about 10,000 years ago at the yeah. earliest. And anatomically modern human beings are thought to have first come on the scene about 200,000 years ago. Now, there's some discussion, you know, maybe 150. It was only 6, years, right? <laughs> oh yeah, well, that's, well, that's a different conversation. But uh, among the non-Jesus freak crowd, the um, yeah, about two hundred thousand years ago. So we're talking about over ninety-five percent of our existence as a distinct modern species that we lived as hunter-gatherers. So that's very relevant to what kind of animal we are. Mm -hmm. Just like yeah. wolves are very relevant to an understanding of dogs, right? You got to sort of look at where an animal comes from. So uh, all. Every hunter-gatherer community that's ever been studied in any part of the world, whether it's Papua New Guinea or Brazil or the Inuit or whatever, they all share resources. And uh, anthropologists refer to them as fierce egalitarians. So, um, and the reason for this isn't that they're noble savages or they're you know inherently better people somehow. It's that when you're living in a fluid, interdependent hunter-gatherer group, the best way to mitigate risk is through sharing. Yeah. Also, you're all nomadic, so you're carrying everything. So everybody doesn't want to be schlepping around their own cooking pot and their own this and their own that. It just makes more sense to share, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that the sharing of resources is the central organizing principle of hunter-gatherer societies, not the hoarding of private property as it is in our society. One of the the shamans uh, that I, I've done some work with, or at least a book I read, uh, was talking about how you can own time or space, and that prehistoric people 
basically said that we own time, so we don't own space. And that if you want to own your property, own space, then you lose control of time and you start, you know, fearing the aging and the death. So it's like really radical, fundamental, like assumptions about reality behind things. But when you go back that, that period of time, like how long was the day? I don't know. We didn't have watches. So it, was, it was a long day or kind of a short day, but like, like it was much less of a focus cognitively. Yeah. So it changed the consciousness of things. And, uh, I, I was also thinking, uh, about how you said that people like wouldn't want to share, you know, sort of the, the, the perspective that we're all protecting our women and making sure that, you know, that, right. that they're ours from a individual perspective that works from a species perspective, it doesn't work at all. Right. So the question is, you know, is it the selfish gene where just each person's genes want to win? And yeah, there's some element of that in, in evolution, but I think also the species kind of wants to win and survive and we're uniquely adapted to survive ice ages and all those other things that kill other people because we've got the genes, but we've also got the sharing. Right. What we do better than any other species is, is adapt. Yeah. And not adapt as individuals, but adapt as a species. Yeah, adapt as, an organism. as Right, yeah. a super organism. Mm -hmm. Right. So we're able to cooperate in ways that no other animal can cooperate and to innovate, brainstorm among mm -hmm. uh, individuals. So we're able to configure and reconfigure, almost like the way the brain reconfigures yeah. in, in ways. Um, that no other species is able to do and sharing's a big part of that and this idea that i've got my wife and my kids and i go out and shoot a deer and i bring it back and i'm going to use that meat to feed my wife yeah. and my kids and the hell with all the rest of you that's not the way it works that's the opposite of the way it works yeah. so in the book we say that this tendency to look at the the modern world and the way things work in this world and to project that into prehistory as a way to sort of uh, justify and explain the modern world, we call that Flintstonization, right? People <laughs> are Flintstonizing, <laughs> yeah. So it's funny when, you know, we were talking about uh, animal models. When you read mainstream uh, treatments or, or even some scientific, popular scientific treatments of this question of monogamy, you'll often read about prairie voles and swans and penguins mm -hmm. and, you know, and that's like if your dog is, you know, tearing up your, your sofa, are you going to go get a book about penguins to try to understand your dog? Well, well, there's the Greek woman who turned into a swan that ties it all together. Le Leda, Leda, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Leda and the swan. Well, she didn't turn into a swan. She got oh, raped she... by a swan. Oh, sorry. I, I... Zeus transformed himself into a swan <laughs> and raped her. It was the yeah. Zeus, selfish Zeus genes that caused all yeah. this problem. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so if you're going to look at animal models, you got to look at the animals most closely related, mm -hmm. which are chimp and bonobo. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I buy this. So one of the questions that I know our listeners are eager to hear is, like, what are the common things people do that hurt their sexual performance? Things like that. I, I mean, we really kind of got into the sociological aspects, but right. you've got some advice on that front. Uh, well, I think the main thing, the main danger that I would, uh, I would watch out for is unrealistic expectations which relates back to the book, of course, because what we're trying to say in the book is not you shouldn't be monogamous or you should be monogamous or, or, you know, we're not given advice on how people should live their sex lives. But what we are saying is at least start from a realistic assessment of what kind of animal Homo sapiens is. Yeah. Right? So once you understand that, then give yourself and your partner a break. Because if you choose monogamy, if and, and and let's face it, you know, in the world the way it's configured right now, it's kind of hard not to be monogamous or at least pretend to be, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so a lot of people are going to choose to to live a monogamous life, which I often say is like choosing to be a vegetarian. You know, it, it can be economical, it can be ethical. There are lots of reasons why being a vegetarian can be a really good decision, but don't expect it to come naturally, right? It's a viable path, but it's an uphill path. And just because you've decided to become a vegetarian doesn't mean that bacon suddenly doesn't smell good anymore, right? So understand where these appetites come from and accept that they're going to be there no matter what you choose to do no matter how you choose to live your life you're still going to have these 
appetites. You're still going to be interested in other people, no matter how much you love your partner. People have this misunderstanding that if you love someone, then you'll only be attracted to that person. Fact is, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, and the fact that you think about other people or you're attracted to other people or you fantasize about other people and so on, that doesn't mean there's a problem with your marriage or your relationship. It doesn't mean there's a problem with your partner or a problem with you. It just means you're a homo sapien. That's what happens when you put this animal in that situation. So I think that's the main thing that, pe you know, it's like it, it, everything becomes this death spiral, like, you know, erectile dysfunction. Right, most erectile dysfunction is psychological. It's not physi physiological, uh, in most cases. So what happens? You've got a problem. You, you know, you you don't get a hard on or something. The worst thing you can do is freak out about it, because then it becomes a recurring problem. Yeah. If you don't freak out about it and you realize there are lots of ways to make love that don't even involve your penis, then there's no problem. Mm -hmm. You know, next time everything works. So, you know, it's like what they said about politics. The, the cover-up is the crime, you know, mm -hmm. the, cri the cover-up's worse than the crime right. or whatever. Same thing in sexuality. Like, often the, the guilt and the shame and the, the response to the situation is a much bigger problem than the situation itself. Some of the biohacking techniques around controlling the sympathetic nervous system have a huge impact in the bedroom mm. because they teach you to consciously turn off that fight or flight. Like, oh no, like, you know, she won't love me. I didn't get it up or whatever that sort of thing is that's going mm. on in your head. In terms of, of your experiences, both, you know, writing the book and doing research for the book and just in general life, like, like what are the things that people can do to, to basically short circuit that kind of guilt, shame thing that happens in the bedroom? Well, you know, I think uh, uh, mindfulness is is very important, whether just uh, self-awareness and, and, as I was saying, awareness of what sort of um, creature we are. I mean, you know, people, I, I started, we're talking about TED, I started my TED talk by saying, um, we didn't descend from apes, we are apes, right? And that I think that's a really important point to keep in mind. We are apes. We are animals. We sleep and eat and shit and do all the things that all, every other animal does. Uh, and so, you know, to try to, to get confused about the fact that we are animals and we have these animal appetites, nature, and so on, that becomes very problematic. We may be spiritual beings, but we're spiritual beings in an animal body, and we have to acknowledge that. So I think, you know, for me, the, the, the key to, um, to dealing with these sorts of issues is always compassion and compassion for the self. Uh, you know, without compassion for the self, there can be no compassion for others. So, um, I guess that's why I'm a lazy, undisciplined bastard, because I just have too much compassion for myself. I, <laughs> I give myself too many breaks. Uh, uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with laziness. Oh, uh, thank you. I, I'm the first guy to say, hurry, meditate faster. <laughs> it takes too long. I mean, <laughs> yeah. let, let's face it. Uh, you know, every time I try to meditate, it's just like a porn film festival. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I did a 10-day Vipassana retreat, you yeah. know, 10 days of silence and sure. all. And man, it was just 10 days of, you know, bad porn in my head. I, uh, I don't know what that says about me. Believe it or not, when you're doing that kind of meditation, you're trying to get your alpha brainwaves higher. Mm. One of the things that I learned doing the 40 years of Zen kind of training that, that I've done is that if you want to raise your alpha waves a lot, think about sex. Really? Yeah, and you can see it. So if, if, if when you're kind of surfing your brain waves and you realize that you're stuck, like you, you can't get it up, and you kind of box yourself in and, and you can't get it up, get your brain waves up. You can hear a sound when your alpha waves get higher. So then all you have to do is think about breasts or <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you'll, you'll break through and you'll bring it back. So it's actually a technique that is totally okay. So if what you were doing was working on getting your alpha brain waves higher during Vipassana, unconsciously working right. on that, it could have been your brain just saying, hey, like sex has a positive effect on this specific thing, and where do you th who do you think has the highest alpha brainwaves of all? Zen masters. Yeah. They have some other brainwaves mixed in there, but they they get you know really high alpha in the back. They have the moves to the front. So there you go. You you're feeling guilty about your vipassana performance, but it turns <laughs> out, I mean, well you know self compassion. I mean, my if, <laughs> if the idea is to focus the brain, right? Yeah. 
Uh -huh. The one thing that, you know, for a lot of people, it's easiest to focus the brain on is sex. See, it's, food and sex are yeah. the two big ones, right? Comes oh, naturally. We are yeah. apes, aren't we? <laughs> there you go. We are promiscuous apes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, it's interesting, like, even talking about animal models. Gorillas, people don't realize gorillas, uh, a fully erect gorilla penis is about mm -hmm. the size of your pinky finger. That's, the, that's all a gorilla's got. And gorilla testicles are the size of kidney beans. Wow. Whereas a chimpanzee or a bonobo, uh, testicles are the size of a chicken egg. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, we're talking about anatomical correlates to, mm -hmm. to mating behavior. That's one of the big ones. The testicular, uh, the ratio of testicular size to overall body size. That tells you how promiscuous the females in any given species are. So, uh, female gorillas only have sex with the alpha male, with the silverback. That's why his penis and testicles are so small, because there's no sperm competition taking place. Right. The competition takes place between the individuals. So if we were gorillas, you and I would fight. Uh, whoever wins would control all the females. The other one gets expelled from the group. Mm -hmm. And so you've got these roving bands of angry bachelors in gorilla <laughs> land. Uh, whereas in chimps and bonobos, as particularly in bonobos, what you have is everybody's getting laid all the time. Mm -hmm. And so the competition, on in Darwinian competition, is taking place within the female's reproductive tract between the sperm cells. So that allows the, um, the development of larger social groups with multiple males because we're not always fighting over access to females. We're all getting laid. That way we can coordinate hunting trips and you know, do all these other things that make us a much more powerful species. Yeah, from a species-wide perspective, there are obvious advantages to that model. We take care of each other's kids. Yeah. You go hunting one day and come back empty-handed, mm -hmm. but I got something, so yeah. we all eat. And the next day you get something I don't, we all eat again. It, it, the, the biggest example that I can think of there is when you're stopped at, a, at an intersection in most major cities and, and there's that kind of wretched looking homeless guy asking for money, they do that because people know that you share, right? So not everyone shares, but someone always does enough that these guys keep doing it. Right? And the people who don't share suffer from that. Yeah. We all suffer from, from uh, inequality. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm sure you've read the research that uh, economic inequality uh, leads to uh, significant health uh, deterioration. Uh, you know, obviously for the people at the bottom because they're not getting access mm -hmm. in the U.S., not getting access to health care and so on. But it creates stress for everybody. It creates stress for the people at the top. Um, I've got friends who are extremely wealthy, and I can see that they, there are psychological defense mechanisms that they develop over time because it's difficult for them. They're, they're wondering, and I've been, I've never like been extremely wealthy, but I have spent a lot of my time backpacking through places like India. Mm -hmm. And the fact, what I paid for my airline ticket to get there is more than those families will make yeah. in 20 years. So I have been mm -hmm. extremely wealthy, right? Because I've put myself in this right. position. Um, it's all relative anyway. And you can see, I saw it in myself, developing mental, psychological defense mechanisms so that I could live with the fact that I've got money in my pocket that could save this family, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to give it to them. Yeah. You know, that hurts. And so you need to l develop these, this scar tissue in a way yeah. so you can continue to live in this context. I, I've got some experience with that. When I was 26, I made $6 million mm. in the dot-com boom. So I was, you know, I came from a relatively middle class to poor family. And all of a sudden, like, I have more money than God. And, you know, all of a sudden you're like, well, wait, like, sh should I give some of that money? It, it's actually, it was really stressful to, yeah. to get all the money. And then of course the company went bankrupt a couple years later and it was even more stressful to lose all the money to slowly go up and then come back down uh, and yeah. then, you know, kind of go back nose to the grindstone and just sort of realize what a dumbass I'd been <laughs> when I had all the money <laughs> because, yeah. you know, I, I didn't do more things to help more people and I didn't honestly take care of my money or myself because no one teaches you right. what to do when you become wealthy, especially at a young age. Right. Uh, and since then, I have some clients who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars in my Bulletproof coaching practice. And uh, it's very interesting. Most of them are, are keenly aware of suffering in the world and they identify problems and they go after it. And then you get other guys like Bill Gates. He didn't do squat. His entire 
like active career for like I don't think he gave any money to charity. And then when he was done, he's like, "Good God, what do I do with all this?" Well, okay, we'll start the foundation, and now they're doing things like they're going after Monsanto. Very cool. Yeah. But the psychological ride for me to be, you know, relatively poor, extremely wealthy, see, build the scar tissue, and then like crash again mm. and be relatively poor again, you know, at least by by the standards of Silicon Valley, not right. necessarily by the standards of India. Right. But your comment about there being scar tissue there is, is phenomenal and yeah. you're tying that back to essentially sperm competition <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> it's how did that. <laughs> it, it's it's a it's very cool because what yeah. you're saying is like if our society is set up for sharing even when you get wealthy if you don't share right it, it costs you and, and it's a subtle biological thing but you're not part of the system when you do that you're yeah above it well i'm writing a book now called civilized to death i was going to ask you about that yeah, yeah well, let's do it perfect that, timing that's yeah. part of it I, I essentially the argument of the book is that we are living in this artificially created environment that we've created for ourselves that is directly in conflict with a lot of our evolved appetites so where sex at dawn focuses primarily on the sexual mm -hmm. aspect of that conflict this new book is is looking at other things like uh, and, and you know there are a lot of there are a lot of books that look at stuff like this, like Michael Pollan's work with uh, diet and uh, the book you probably read, Born to Run. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, McDougall's book about movement, and so there there are different um, uh, people looking at different aspects of this. A lot of your work is looking at aspects of this as well. What I'm trying to do in this book is look at less um, things that people haven't looked at yet, like this relationship to money, for example. Or, or power, uh, I mentioned earlier, politics. It's very interesting that in these egalitarian societies like the ones we evolved in, the worst thing you can do uh, in terms of uh, getting accruing power is to express any interest in wanting to be a leader. Mm -hmm. So someone who wants to be the leader yeah. is considered ridiculous right. and pathetic. So he'll never be a leader. <laughs> right. Leadership goes to people who have no interest yeah. in being leaders. Mm -hmm. So you look at that, you know, in terms of our political system, like all these, you know, the Senate is full of egomaniacs. Yeah. You know, they're they're crazed for power and they're exactly the worst people to be in positions of power because they abuse it. Of mm -hmm. course they do. It's like sending an alcoholic to go buy some wine for the party. <laughs> you know, it's he's not going to come back with the wine. He's going to be drunk halfway. Yeah. That You don't want people who... who are intoxicated by power to be in positions of power yeah. but that's what we do we do everything upside down it's all backwards and weird you know and as as your experience testifies we've set this whole thing up where we're chasing money or power or whatever mm -hmm. it is but we do it in a way that achieving it contaminates the prize right yeah. so if you end up succeeding in getting all that money then what do you have you have a life where you're suspicious of your friends because they're all trying to use you or you're afraid they are yeah. every woman you're with you're not sure if she's really into you or she's got some agenda yeah everything becomes ugly and stressful it having money uh, at large numbers like that is terribly stressful in ways that you would never predict. You're right. absolutely right. right. So you're going to cover this in your book. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do wow. this. I'm going to do the frustration of adolescent sexuality. That you know, here we live in this society. You you were a teenage boy. I was a teenage boy. Okay. You're 14. All you can think about is sex, but you're not going to get laid for quite a while. So does not getting some make you kill people? I think it can. I think the. I think we underestimate or, or we don't talk about how intense that frustration is mm -hmm. and those are long years right oh, 14 yeah. <laughs> 15 16 17 those are long long years and i think that that extreme frustration that a lot of people feel at those ages can manifest as misogyny mm -hmm. i think a lot of these serial killers a lot of you know just asshole dudes <laughs> who hate women, yeah. that's why they hate women. Because they went through those years where they wanted something that women controlled and women weren't giving it to them and they couldn't figure out how to get it. So they either, they respond with anger and aggression or, you know, maybe they get into the whole, the game and the, the pickup scene yeah. and, you know, try to figure it out, mm -hmm. do it by the book, um, which is, there's some misogyny in some yeah. aspects of that world, not all of them. But, um, 
Yeah, I think I think it's a significantly uh, underreported, under considered aspect of Western civilization. There was a guy named uh, Prescott who did a meta analysis. He wanted to understand the relationship between um, adolescent sexual frustration and violence in societies. Yeah. And he found that I think he looked at 27 societies and with one only one exception didn't fit this rule, the Mojave, I think. Um, the other 26, in every case, societies that allow adolescents to express themselves sexually had proportionally lower levels of violence. So there's almost a sense in which we create the sexual frustration in adolescents as a way to sustain a warlike society. Wow. Yeah. When you get past adolescence, uh, I've given a talk and I did a year-long sort of study where I looked at the Taoist equation for immortality, which says you take your age in years, you subtract seven and divide by four. And that's the number of days for men that should be spaced out, be, that you should have between your ejaculations. And I tested the result of that on basically my general happiness level. So I quantified my daily happiness and satisfaction with everything. And I tried the eight day and I tried the 30 day thing. And the 30 days was one of the hardest things that I can do. And, you know, I'm 40, I have reasonably healthy sex drive. But to basically not ejaculate for 30 days straight was an enormous act of will. And honestly, it took like three months of trying before I could, I could learn how to manage that impulse. <clears throat> and this is as a grown man, right? Yeah. yeah. As a teenager, the equation would obviously be like every day or two. Uh, but, but still, it, it, I wonder if there's, as you get older and as you get wiser and you get more mature, whether there's like changes that you're planning to talk about or you're thinking about or just that you've, you've experienced. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think part of that's hormonal, right, yeah. as, as testosterone levels uh, decrease. One of the things we talk about in the book, um, which relates to one of your earlier questions as well, is uh, we talk about how uh, common it is for men, middle-aged men, to who have been monogamous for a long time to have an affair and then convince themselves they're in love and leave their families yeah. and, you know, sort of throw everything mm -hmm. away. Um, and one of the things we hypothesize in the book is that uh, it's very interesting that one of the uh, very few things that will reliably increase a man's testosterone levels is having sex with a novel partner. So here's a guy, right, in his mid-40s, mm -hmm. whatever, kind of tired and run down and, you know, married for a long time and has an affair and suddenly colors are richer and food tastes better yeah. and the music's, you know, he mm -hmm. feels young again. So what's he think? He thinks he's in love. It I, must be love. I, I think we just figured out that bioidentical testosterone supplementation might make you more, have, basically have a higher degree of fidelity. Oh, really? I mean, it seems like it. I, I just thought of that. But you're right. That's one of the things that happens there. I've been using testosterone since I was 30. Mm. Not to get my levels ultra high, you know, you know, I, I'm, I'm super ripped. But <laughs> just because I was obese. I, I mean, I was 300 pounds. Really? Oh, yeah. And I was pretty unhealthy when I was young. I had arthritis yeah. in my knees when I was 14. So I, I kind of suffered a lot. And, you know, I saw stretch marks. So I was like... All right, I'm going to get on testosterone, went to an anti-aging physician, got my numbers. I've been doing this for 10 years. My numbers have never been above the high end of the range. But I wonder what my colors, you know, what my zest for life would be like if I let it, if I hadn't done that. Mm. Like, yeah, I, who knows? Maybe I'd feel, you know, amazingly attracted to, you know, all these other women uh, mm. and then act on it versus now because my testosterone high. I'm like, yeah, like <laughs> she's attractive. <laughs> my wife is real attractive too, but like, I'm going to have sex with one of them <laughs> every 11 days. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, or I guess yours would be, I was calculating my number oh, earlier yeah. when you were yeah, talking. Mine's I only think, eight. Yours yeah, 11. I'm about 11. But, but yeah, it's, it's not that you can't have sex more often. It's yeah, that you it's don't orgasm. ejaculate. Yeah, yeah. Here's the corollary to that, right. which is kind of cool. The less often you ejaculate, the more often you have sex. Uh -huh. Because you're like, I gotta get some. I get, like, like, see, so you actually feel much younger when you do that. I, right. I really did feel a, a massive improvement in um, in just my general happiness with life. I was shocked at the difference in the numbers. I'll uh, I'll give that a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, plus, the carpal tunnel improved dramatically. <laughs> 
Oh wait, we're on the air. No. Is one of your sponsors the Fleshlight by no, any chance? God, no. no? <laughs> it's an old old Rogan sponsor. Are they really? Yeah, they sponsored Rogan for like a year. That's I, hilarious. And I was talking to him about it, and he was like, "Yeah, I think they pulled out because um, they figured they'd sold as many fleshlights to my audience as they were going to get." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I, I knew we were going to get to the flashlight. Got to get to the flashlight. Yeah, it's good for the carpal tunnel. So, when is your new book coming out? I, 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 I don't know. I got to write the damn thing. I, I'm sort of. Ha mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the midst of writing it now. Um, spring to summer of okay. next year of 2014. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Thank I'd you. Love to have you on the show again. Oh, thanks. Out. That would be great. Yeah. Now you've got a podcast too, and I'm sure a lot of people who hear this are going to want to check out what you're doing. You've had some oh, cool. phenomenal guests on there. Yeah, I'd like to get you on there. I'd, you got it. Um, uh, it's called Tangentially Speaking. Uh, it, they can find it. You can find it at uh, chrisryanphd.com. That's my site. Mm -hmm. Or it's on iTunes and Stitcher and, you know, it's, it's all over. All the places you'd expect. Tangentially okay. speaking. Yeah. In fact, just yesterday, oh, really fascinating episode I just put up. It's, today's Monday. It's going up today. Um, but I, I edited it yesterday uh, with uh, Moshe Kasher and um, Reggie Watts, two comedian actors. Mm -hmm. um, and very interesting talking to, to Moshe. He was raised by deaf parents. Oh, wow. And he worked for a while as an interpreter for deaf people making phone calls and he tells these amazing stories you never think about like a deaf guy who wants to call a sex hotline right <laughs> he it would go through him no. so so moshe is like doing the interpreting between this woman on the sex hotline and this deaf guy who wants to get off wow you know or another example he gave was calls from like these Nigerian scam artists. <laughs> they call deaf people. And and legally, and this is a state uh, funded program for deaf people. As the interpreter, you cannot insert yourself into the conversation. Wow. So even if you, like he, he talked about a case where the guy was saying, okay, I'll be on a flight to Nairobi on Tuesday. And Moshe, as the interpreter is thinking, dude, do not go, don't do that. But he can't say anything. Wow. Yeah. So anyway. That's going to be a cool show. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a very conversational show. It's yeah. really interesting people. Neil Strauss, hopefully you, uh, Andrew Weil, Peter Sagal, all these people. Nice. Um, but it's very like, hey, whatever. Right. Whatever comes up is what we talk about. I'll make sure we include the URL for that in our show notes. The other thing that's going to happen is we have a full transcript of what we talk about that oh, we're putting up so people can search good. this for uh, interesting words like fleshlight or whatever it is. <laughs> Great. <laughs> all right. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for making it out to my uh, biohacking hey, facilities. In the it's an of honor to be yeah. to be in the lair, yeah, in the Batcave. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>